Our next presentation is 2020 Ozone TAD, Changes from a Station Operator's Perspective, presented by Jennifer Eberwein of the Mojave Desert AQMD. During the Q&A session of this presentation, Matt Plate of the US EPA Region 9 and Louise Sorensen of the California Air Resources Board will be joining Jennifer. Hello, my name is Jennifer Eberwein. I'm an air quality instrument technician with the Mojave Desert Air Quality Management District. And today I'll be presenting on the 2020 updates to the ozone tad and how it will likely impact our district's monitoring stations. So first I'll go over a little background on the 2020 ozone tad, then go through the current station setup for the MDA QMD. Next, I'll go through some of the major changes that are coming from the 2020 ozone tad and how the MDA QMD is planning on implementing those changes. And then I'll briefly go through some of the expected changes for the CARB standards lab and some lingering questions and next steps. So first, we'll start with some background. So what is an ozone tad? I imagine a lot of you are familiar with previous versions of this document, but for those of you who are not, the full name is Transfer Standards for Calibration of Air Monitoring Analyzers for Ozone Technical Assistance Document. The current draft version came out in July of 2020, and EPA solicited comments and feedback up until May of 2021. This 2020 version will replace a previous 2013 version of the same document, which replaced a 1979 version. The 2020 ozone tad and its predecessors described the process of ozone traceability, which is defined as a documented, unbroken chain of calibrations traceable to a more authoritative standard. The level one standard reference photometer is your highest authority, and that authority is passed from standard to standard till you get to the instrument that actually measures ambient ozone data at the monitoring site. With each step away from the SRP, you increase your measurement uncertainty. So the 2020 ozone TAD essentially describes what's allowed when it comes to ozone traceability for regulatory air monitoring stations. When the 2020 ozone TAD first came out, I initially thought that this would not apply to my air monitoring stations, but rather the, the standards lab where we get our transfer standard certified. Um, so then this brought up the question, do I need a transfer standard for QC? If you look in the CFR in part 58, appendix A, section 3.1.1 is where the requirements for one point QC checks are defined. They don't explicitly state what equipment is required for QC checks, only at what frequency, which is at least every two weeks, and at what concentration, 5 to 80 ppb for ozone. In section 2.6 of the same appendix, the CFR says pretty clearly, you know, for the CFR, that for both audits and calibrations, your instrument needs a photometer and needs to be a transfer standard. I think a lot of confusion results from the use of different terminology across the different guidance documents. So the CFR details that the equipment used for calibration requires a photometer, but it doesn't explicitly define calibration. And the definition for QC check is even more vague, essentially just going into how often and how much. In the 2020 ozone tad, the definition for calibration focuses on adjustment of the analyzer, which is really similar to the language in the QA handbook. Some monitoring organizations use the terms QC and calibration interchangeably, and will use the same equipment for both the QC checks and the calibration. The 2020 ozone tad doesn't go into this, and the CFR and EPA aren't currently taking a stance on this issue, but CARB generally recommends the use of separate equipment for your QC checks versus calibrations. And keep in mind that you'll have to follow the guidelines outlined in whatever QAP and SOPs your organization is following. So back to the question, do I need a transfer standard for QC? In the 2020 ozone TAD, section 1.1, the purpose of a transfer standard is to transfer traceability, which will have a direct effect on the measured ozone concentration. 
Here's a simplified traceability scheme. Your transfer standard is um, verified against the standard re reference photometer, and then that traceability is transferred to the ozone monitor and to the QC instrument. If the QC instrument isn't used to adjust the ozone monitor, then one could assume that it's the end of the line, much like an ozone analyzer, and could therefore be treated like an analyzer. However, in section 2.1 of the 2020 ozone TAD, it explicitly states that ozone transfer standards are required to conduct measurement quality checks of ozone analyzers. So here's the general traceability scheme of our district. We don't use a level two bench and we don't use the QC instrument to adjust the ozone monitor. So we were treating the QC instrument similar to an ozone analyzer. Which brings me to my next topic, the Mojave Desert AQMD current station setup. As I said, I work for the Mojave Desert Air Quality Management District. We are the second largest district in the state at just under 20,000 square miles. We run six regulatory stations plus two contract stations, one for the Antelope Valley AQMD, which is a regulatory site, and one at the 29 Palms Marine Base, which is not a regulatory site. Across these eight sites, we measure all of the criteria gases plus H2S, continuous PM10 and PM2.5, and also MET. So that makes a total of six regulatory ozone analyzers plus the one at 29 Palms. We also have two stations for mobile smoke monitoring and have deployed around 50 purple layers across the two districts. And we have three techs to keep all this going, so we stay pretty busy. In each of those six regulatory stations, we have an ozone analyzer and a station QC instrument. Our transfer standard, which is considered a level three because under the current terminology, because it's used in the field, is sent on a six month basis to the CARB standards lab to be verified against the level one standard reference photometer. And then it's used on a six month basis to calibrate the ozone analyzers and then on an annual basis to calibrate, calibrate the QC instrument, which is used to generate the automated zero and one point QC or span checks for the ozone analyzer. Our current protocol is loosely based on the 1997 CARB SOP for the Invronix 9100. And so we're probably a little overdue for an update. Based on that current protocol, we do an annual calibration of the QC instrument using a zero and six upscale points with an acceptance criteria of 5% per point. Here's an example of how that would look like in a station. Your station QC instrument is used to generate ozone using the same zero air source as the reference for the transfer standard. The ozone is generated from the station QC instrument up to a manifold where the excess is vented out to maintain ambient pressure and then it's measured by the photometer of the transfer standard. So in our station, we bring in our transfer standard and then connect uh, the ZAG, the zero air generator is teed off to allow for the reference for the transfer standard and to push the ozone from the station QC instrument. So the ozone is generated up to the manifold where the excess is vented off through the inlet probe. And then it's measured simultaneously by the, the photometer of the transfer standard and by the station ozone analyzer. And then if the station QC instrument requires adjustment, we follow the manufacturer's instructions. So that's the way we have been doing it. Next, I'll discuss pertinent changes to the ozone tab. Here in a nutshell is a list of the major changes for the 2020 ozone tag compared to the previous 2013 version. The biggest one for our district is that generator only devices will no longer be allowed for use as a transfer standard. And I'll talk more about that. And then on the upside, um, for the initial verification, three cycles can be completed all on the same day, whereas previously 
six different cycles were required for on six different days. So that should make things easier. Next, the nomenclature has been clarified. Bench versus field is based on application. Bench is a standard that is stationary. Field is one that's moved from station to station. The level is based on the distance from the SRP. For example, our transfer standard is considered a level three because it's used in the field. But going forward, it's going to be considered a level two because it's verified directly against the level one and it's used in the field. So it's, it will now be considered a level two field. Then the re-verification frequency will still be the same, six months, which is based on field versus bench. So a field transfer standard requires re-verification every six months, a bench standard annually. And then finally, the levels two and three now have the same acceptance criteria, which is 3.1% or 1.5 PPB point difference. The, for the regression, the slope needs to be 1 plus or minus 0 0.03, the intercept plus or minus 3 ppb, and then the standard deviation of the three slopes is required to be plus or minus 0 0.0075, and the three intercepts plus or minus 1 ppb. Then for the re-verification, they're introducing this new metric. Instead of the standard deviation, the slope and intercept must fall within a 95% prediction interval, which is based on the data for that transfer standard. So you start with the three regressions for the initial verification, and then your last regression comes from your re-verification. And then each subsequent re-verification replaces that last regression cycle. So the 95% prediction interval is based on the last three regressions performed. To help with these calculations, the EPA has created this handy verification data sheet. It includes conditional pass-fail formatting, can store and archive data, plot historical performance, and generate a summary sheet. And this document can be found on the AMTIC website. It's not required to use this document, but it can be a really good starting point to when you're generating your own reports or worksheets to make sure that you have your calculations correct. That brings us to the next topic, how my district will be impacted by the updates to the ozone tag. So here's a list of the changes that our district is expecting based on this 2020 ozone tag. As I mentioned previously, our current protocol is based on that 1997 CARB SOP for the Invernix 9100, and that's probably due for an update even though we're still using the same basic equipment as we were in 1997. And we have some Envronics from 1997 that are still functioning. Our new protocol will be based on the finalized ozone tag, which is expected to be finalized in 2022. Currently, we're performing an annual calibration on the QC instrument, similar to what we would perform on an ozone analyzer. And that process will need to be changed to incorporate the verification re-verification process which involves three cycles of zero and six upscale points for your initial verification. And then after a repair or a failed re-verification, you would need to go back to that three cycles of a zero and six upscale points. And that verification needs to be performed against a level two bench. In the 2020 ozone tag, all transfer standards need to be traceable back to a level two bench. Our district doesn't currently employ a level two bench. We are using a level three field. So that's potentially an additional piece of equipment that we'll need to purchase and maintain. And then the annual re-verification process is pretty similar to what we're doing current, currently. Of one cycle of a zero and six upscale points. Right now, our six upscale points are based on our QC and span points and the range of the instrument, which is up to 500 PBB. And that's while that's okay, we would probably benefit from adjusting that range down to the calibration scale of the ozone analyzer, which our ozone analyzers are on a calibration scale of zero to 250 PBB. 
And so that's probably what we'll use for our QC instruments going forward. Then our acceptance criteria is going to have to change pretty significantly. Currently, we're using a 5% point difference acceptance criteria, and that will need to change to 3.1% point difference. And then we'll also have to incorporate the regression slope and intercept criteria for that initial verification. And then for the re-verification, they're changing over from a standard deviation, which we weren't previously using anyway, and now they're changing it to that prediction interval, which requires a slope and intercept within 95% of the prediction interval. The biggest anticipated station change for our district is the equipment that we use for QC. As I had mentioned previously, in our stations, we have generator-only devices, which have been working pretty well for us. But according to the 2020 ozone tag, generator only devices will no longer be allowed. So we will need to upgrade all of our equipment to include a photometer that can be verified as level three. There's, there's a variety of options out there for transfer standards. All the equipment that I'm showing here is from Teledyne because that's what we have the most experience with, but there are plenty of other vendors out there I've heard a lot of good things about Thermo, for example. We are leaning towards the T700U because it will allow us to perform both the gas dilution QC checks as well as the ozone and GPT checks so that we can be standardized across all of our stations. However, that particular instrument has a pretty steep price tag of about $20,000. The U is the trace level version, so there's the potential for slight cost savings by going away from the U. However, lowers, levels are moving lower and lower, and so that could potentially turn around and bite us. Then there's the T703 series, which is the ozone only model, which also provides potential cost savings. But I've heard of a lot of agencies that have had a lot of difficulty with the T703 series, and so I'm a little wary of that and we only have two sites that are ozone only, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't help us with the rest of our sites. Then the lowest cost option is the T400, which is the ozone analyzer, and that's about $10,000. However, with the ozone analyzer, you still need an independent ozone generator, and you have to retrofit it to, to use the same zero as you use for your, your ozone generator has to be used for the reference of the photometer. This could potentially allow us to keep our current QC instruments and still be able to comply with the ozone tag. However, um, I'm open to this idea of using the same instrument for both QC and calibration, which could potentially be a great time, time saver considering the very large size of our district to be able to perform remote or automated calibrations in our stations. And for that option, we would need the T700U. So if we go with the T700U, we have six stations plus an additional need for a standard to serve as a level two bench for verifications. That's a cost of around $140,000. Maybe that's not a lot to some districts, but our usual equipment budget is $60,000 a year. So even if we started now and bought just one per year, that would still be about a third of our annual equipment budget that we had previously been planning to apply to other equipment. Plus that's only five out of the seven instruments that we need. So some alternative options to help with the cost, we could go with the lower cost option, though that feels more like a temporary solution. We're really hoping that there might be some funding options coming from the state or the federal level, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We were also fortunate enough to get some pre-used equipment from another very generous district that can get us started. And maybe there's a possibility of the EPA granting extensions that allow us a little bit more time to spread out the expense of the situation. So here's what we're thinking about across our stations. We replace all of our QC instruments with the T700U, and then in our main in our main station, our main headquarters, which is our cleanest station, 
we take that T700U and send it back for annual re-verification against the level one bench, which would make it a level two bench, which we can use for the initial verification for the rest of the station T700Us. Then everything else would be pretty much the same. Our field transfer standard would get sent back on a six month verification, and then that would be used to perform the six month calibration of the ozone analyzer and then the annual re-verification of the station QC instruments. So I was asked to mention the plan changes for the CARB standards lab, so that's next. After these changes are implemented going forward, the CARB standards lab will only be certifying to level two they will require acceptance testing before certification, which would have to include a proof of preventative maintenance and a preliminary zero and span. And then another major change that zero will be used for regression, but it will no longer be used to autocorrect upscale points. So if you have any further questions about the CARB standards lab, then I would direct you to talk to Louise Sorensen because that's all I know about that. And finally, that brings us to lingering questions and next steps. So this new ozone pad has not yet been finalized. The EPA took a lot of feedback following the release of the 2020 draft, and now we just have to wait and see what ends up in the final document. Some of the biggest concerns that came out of the comments on the draft were, first off, the requirement for the photometer in the QC instrument, I don't really see them changing their stance on this one. They had a fair amount of justification for this requirement, so I suspect that this one is going to stick. Next, the requirement that all transfer standards must be traceable back to a level two bench. Maybe that requirement will be loosened. And I also believe there needs to be some clarification on whether the instrument needs to be transported back to the level two bench, such as after a repair or a failed re-verification. Also, there was discussion of developing a minimum criteria for the prediction interval metric for the re-verification, because when you have an instrument that performs really, really well, then that creates this impossibly small prediction interval. So they're working on developing possibly a minimum criteria. Another big area of concern is the need for a separate piece of equipment for calibration versus QC. For those of us in the CARB PQAO, we will probably have to wait for CARB to take an official stance on that issue. Then there's the topic of funding assistance. There is currently $22 million in direct grants for air agencies coming from the American Rescue Plan. This has a focus on using that money towards PM 2.5, specifically switching out FRM for continuous monitoring, but there's a lot of wiggle room in the in the solicitation that allows for other NAX monitoring. And so we're hoping that some of that money can be directed towards offsetting the costs of purchasing this new equipment. So next steps, we wait and see. EPA plans to conduct a rulemaking to codify the ozone TAD in the CFR with the goal to be complete by the end of 2022. And then from that date, we will have two years to comply with the new rules. And then also during that time would be the development of new QAPs and SOPs that will trickle down to the districts if you're in the CARB PQAO. And then also, did I mention money? Uh, like I said, we will, be, we will be trying for ARP funding and we've been really pushing for additional sources of funding at the state or federal level because um, I know we are not the only district where a large amount of our equipment budget is going to have to be directed towards complying with this new rule and hopefully nothing else breaks in the meantime. So fingers crossed for additional funding sources. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. I'd like to give special thanks to Louise Sorensen for her help and guidance in putting this presentation together. And thanks to the members of the Curriculum Advisory Committee that gave me feedback on my presentation. And this child pretty much depicts the way I feel about this entire thing. 
I'm very sorry if I've given you any impression that I'm an expert on this issue, but if you have any questions, hopefully we have someone here that can help to answer them. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, if we could have you, Louise and Matt, go ahead and turn on your cameras and mics. Um, we can enter the um, Q&A portion. So we've got a question here that says, um, where on the AMTIC website can I find the verification data spreadsheet as mentioned in the latest TAD, Appendix B? Um, maybe Matt can speak to that. I don't think it's on the website yet. I think it's still being sort of beta tested. Am I correct there? Yeah, it, it was emailed out to mm -hmm. a, the list of, uh, of all the agencies. So, you know, it sh you should have got it that way. Um, if you need another version, you can go ahead and send me an email. Um, I, I have it. And they have actually updated it from the original version that was sent out that had a few errors in it. Okay, great. Um, could you put your email in the chat, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, there is another question. Um, we currently only have one bench primary standard, level two. CAR performs certification on this bench standard. Region 9 EPA QA is currently asking us to verify that bench standard when it is returned to us from CARB to check if it is operating to specs after it was transported back to us. This means buying another bench standard, level two. Is this a requirement? So it's not necessarily a requirement that you, you would have to verify with another level two standard, although a lot of a lot of agencies have two level two standards so they can verify their standards when they come back. Um, I, I would say it's probably possible for you to, to use your ozone analyzers to verify it when it comes back. You at least the ozone analyzer is a, you know is another photometer that you can use to verify it if you don't have a second level two standard. And, and I would also say, you know, this is something we have been asking agencies where they're shipping their standards, you know, by air and, you know, it's being handled by UPS or FedEx and there's potential for there to be problems with the standard when it arrives back. I think, you know, we have preferred people to, when they can, you know, to drive their standards to CARB to have them certified. Um, so that there's a little bit, you know, you have more control over the handling of the standard in shipping. Um, I have a question if there's no, nothing else. Um, is the current timeline, is that still um, accurate in terms of expecting the final document to come out in 2022? Um, I'm, yeah, 2022, I'm pretty certain. I mean, we're really far along on, on looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem right now is, you know, it requires a regulatory edit to mm -hmm. put the new date of the new document into the ozone regulation. So because of that, it kind of slows down our, our process. Um, and so, so yes, it, 2022 is probably reasonable. Can you speak to any of the potential changes that came from the comments from the original draft? I, I haven't been working through the comments yet, so I, I haven't seen them. I don't know if Louise has been on any calls where, where we're just discussing comments, but um, it's, so far I think it's just the EPA lead region and headquarters team who's been working on those. That's correct. The, um, Matt, Matt and I um, are not part of or working with the group on the comments. It's just, um, I believe, the three, um, Greg, Noah, and um, Scott Hamilton, and Keith, uh, I believe his last name is Harris, um, that those three were working with the comments. Um, Brian asks, do you folks know of any particularly helpful resources for setting up the T700U in terms of its original photometer verification? Currently, we simply treat it as we do the T703s. 
The real key is getting the thing to work well when used for GPT. Hi, hi Louise, do you have an answer? I don't, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't set up equipment out in the field um, and we don't have a field person from CARP on. So um, I, I would, um, I will find out, um, maybe CARP has some, an SOP or whatnot that can um, help you set it up correctly. Um, if you have concerns that you, or you just want to check it. Um, so I, I'll give, I'll take, um, I don't know how to get your email, but I'll take that question down, uh, Grace. I don't know how to respond to that. Oh, I'll give you my email. I'll, how about I'll type my email in there and then you can send me an email with the question and I'll see if I can find you an answer. Oh, Thanks. Thanks. Um, sorry. That's okay. Can I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, from my experience using it, um, we uh, don't use the T700 in the station as the QC instrument. We use it as a transfer standard. And so we use it for calibration. And I haven't had much issue with the GPT part of that, mostly because your ozone, you can calculate that based on the difference in NO. So that's my personal experience with it. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here for Matt. Uh, what is your opinion of using the same standard to do both automated QC checks and calibration adjustment of the station ozone analyzer? Well, I, I think we're okay with that from an EPA standpoint. I think, you know, CARB has been doing separate calibrations and QC checks, and I think it's a really good practice. Um, from our standpoint, it's not absolutely required, but I would say it does add value to the CARB PQAO. And, you know, part of the PQAO, which we talked about this morning, is kind of having common procedures. So I, I don't want to take that away from the CARB PQAO. I, I think it's really a PQAO is issue, but for the other monitoring agencies on, you know, certainly they, they have discretion. Um, Hien says, the verification data spreadsheet in draft form received comments from the public, some of which are still awaiting responses from EPA since May 2021. Hopefully all comments will be addressed by 2022. That's my understanding. I think um, Carl's comment is in reply to Brian's, the T700U has a step to set the gen prior to a GPT. Um, David Cardiel asks, so station calibrators, level three benches, are required to be traceable to the SRP and can't be considered as endline instruments, right? Like we can't consider it to be an analyzer? No. I do think, um, yeah, uh, Matt said no, because that's what I think is currently written in the TAD and we did um, have a question um, back to the um, group um, who wrote the document on on that specific uh, topic. And we don't have an answer yet. <laughs> but we'll find out when the final document comes out. So from my perspective, going into this, the 2020 ozone had came out. I wasn't really familiar with the 2013 version. I was kind of going on historically what we'd been doing, plus a little bit of information I'd gathered from, from CARB. And um, so what we're doing now is not really in line with the 2013 ozone tad, um, but until the new finalized 2020 tad comes out, do you have any recommendations for what do I do in the interim? How do I maintain best practices until a finalized document is, is ready. Does that make sense? Uh, I, yeah, I guess. Uh, you're so, you know, whatever you're doing is, mm -hmm. you should document what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, continue doing it. I, I think at this point, you know, the only thing that we were asking people to pull back is those agencies that had IZSs that were internal to instruments that mm -hmm. were calibrated with the instrument, 
those are being replaced. Hopefully they've all been replaced. That was uh, what we were looking for in the PQAO. Um, if you're using generator only instruments, um, I think that you know we're clarifying that in the new TAD. I have to say when Luis and I got onto the work group, we were very surprised that most of the rest of the country considers generator only instruments as not usable for quality control checks or calibrations, which uh, is was was somewhat surprising to me um, mm -hmm. because it was you know it was allowed but not encouraged in the 2013 document. But the regul the way the regulation is written, and, and you pulled up that specific point, it, it looks like a photometer is required, and other EPA regions were interpreting that as a photometer is absolutely required. Um, it, it's a vulnerability in our networks, um, but you know we're you know we're going to wait for the new tab to go in place, and then we've asked for a two year transition period in order to replace those instruments. I don't think they're going to give us an extension over two years because. You know, like I said, there's also this strong opinion in the rest of the country that we shouldn't have been using generators in the first place. I, I don't know if Louise, if that's your perception, but that's my perception. No, that was uh, that I had the same perception. Perception. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kathy made a comment. Um, all of the ICS instruments in CAR PQAO have been replaced. Thanks, Kathy. Any other questions? We'll leave this up a bit. Um, to give some people time to type one if they do well, have a question. I would just I'd like to point out that the 2013 TAD is, is in force and it's required by regulation, which most of our other guidance documents are not. So we have to follow the 2013 protocols until the new TAD goes into place because that's going to be going to place with a regulatory change. So just reminding people that even though the 2020 TAD maybe easier in some ways, like you don't have to do this six by six, you can't start implementing it until we actually put it in place formally in regulation. So then for our district where we're not doing that initial six by six verification, you're saying that we need to go back and do that across all the QC instruments? It sh it, yeah, that should be done. You should be doing a six by six, but it's just a little strange on a generator instrument how you do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Louise in the standards lab may have some insight on the, the generator instruments, but um, yeah, I don't know. Well, we don't have, we don't see any generator only devices in there um, other than, well, we don't really, so um, yeah. But I can help you with anything, any questions on that, Jennifer, if you want. If you if you need help setting it up for the six point. Okay. Um, I mean, I can do the one by six, so I can do it six times, right? <laughs> yeah, I just think there's some questions like generator stability and, and QC and how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, I guess we could try it and then see how it goes. And then from there, um, approach in terms of re repeatability. I don't know if I've looked at repeatability of the 9100 in <clears throat> these in these limitations um, in terms of like looking at your standard deviation of your regressions um, and that sort of slope, <laughs> slope offset of regressions. I have, I've never looked at it in that light, but otherwise our 9100s have been pretty solid. They've been pretty reliable instruments from my experience. Yeah, I just, I would just caution you and, and maybe we need to talk to some of the, the caliber, Airby calibrators to, to talk about this mm -hmm. because, you know, you, you have the data, you can look back through your last six checks of each of your instruments and see what mm -hmm. the stability is. 
But what I don't want you to do is like use some average, you know, slope and intercept for a generator. If the generator response is changing over time, you know, that's not going to give you better quality data, obviously. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, thanks, David. Um, well, if you guys don't have any other questions for our speakers, um, Louise and Matt put their emails in the chat. Um, Jennifer, could you do the same? Um, someone said, Sounds like um, ozone generation during GPT might be a good topic for discussion with the Teledyne folks during the vendor portion. So thank you, that's a good lead in to um, what I was about to say. Um, we have a break right now from 12 to one, and then at one to three is our, um, our vendor, our live vendor exhibit, virtual vendor exhibit, um, from one to three over at Feed, on Feed Loop. Um, Teledyne is one of our, our vendors. Um, for each exhibitor, there is a join live button up top that will enable you to meet the vendor staff live face-to-face -to, -face to simulate kind of the experience of visiting a live booth. Um, just FYI, this feature has a 25 participant limit at any given time. So if an exhibitor is at capacity, you can check back periodically to see if a spot has opened during, you know, the 1 to 3 p.m. hours. Um, in the meantime, feel free to visit another exhibitor. Um, in each booth, you'll be able to view any video and documents that the um, vendor has uploaded. There's also a request information button up top um, that will give you the ability to send the vendor your contact information and, um, and you guys can connect that way. Um, I've got a couple. Okay, I think people are just saying thanks. Um, yeah, so thank you to our presenters, our, our um, Q&A panelists, Matt, Jennifer, and Louise. Um, and we will see you all um, hopefully at the vendor booths from one to three. Um, and then we will resume the um, presentation portions of our training 8 a.m. tomorrow morning over on Feed Loop. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Thanks, Jennifer, for the heavy lift. <laughs> Thank you, Jen and Matt, for coming on. Yes. Thanks, Matt, for being here. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay.